Hey everyone, hope you're doing well. This is The Deep Dive. My name is Drew Kriegmer. I'm the Director of Advisory Services here at Kriegmer Wealth. And I'm joined, as always, uh, by John Kriegmer, our Founder and Senior Wealth Advisor. And John, we're going to talk about some current events, some current economic data, what the Federal Reserve is doing mm -hmm. with interest rates, um, and just filling in the gaps of what all these moving pieces mean and why they're important to understand the data and the impacts from the data. Um, I know we've, there's been a lot of concern here going all the way back to 2022 about how inflation was going to be wrangled without putting the economy into a recession. Uh, so I just want to walk through some recent data and news uh, that has come up on that front. Uh, but before we do, John, how are you doing today? And who is your pick for the NFL Super Bowl champion this year as uh, the season <laughs> I'll tell you what I don't I I I hate to say I've not spent a lot of time researching the NFL uh, this year on the teams. Um I would say since uh, the Chicago Bears are on hard knocks, um you could give them kind of that wild card vibe and feel to think hey they're going to make it. I know a lot of my uh, a lot of my Packers friends um they think that this year's be a good bounce back year and um the second year as far as with the new quarterback in that primary role um, I'll tell you what, though, it's hard to go against the uh, the 49ers and uh, the Chiefs to get there and throw the Eagles in the mix. A lot of parity right now, and uh, so I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna anger or upset anybody or give anyone ammunition to uh, to say I told you so. But uh, um, I think it should be a fun, exciting year. Same thing for the NCAA football this year. Uh, I think both of them are going to be fun and exciting this year. Yeah, yeah, they definitely will be in the first uh, year with 12, a 12 team playoff on the college side of things. So I'll be interested to see how all that plays out. Um, but exciting, it kind of a reminder here that we are entering into the best part of fall uh, where the weather cools off a little bit and we've got some fun fall activities going on. But, John, let's go ahead and hop into this data. So, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve was out in Jackson Hole at their annual meeting out there. Uh, and Jerome Powell reaffirmed that we can expect to have a 25 to 50 point. Uh, interest rate cut. Uh, what that means is 0.25% or 0.5% cut to the core inflation or interest rate. And the reason the Federal Reserve feels comfortable doing that is because inflation has come down here over the last 18 months to a more acceptable range. Um, and the Federal Reserve does not want to possibly worsen things economically. At the same time, though, John, we've seen unemployment rise. Um, and we have some interesting data like 82% of all jobs created in the last year uh, were in some way associated with the government, whether that be education, healthcare, or directly working for federal or state or local government. Um, and whenever you see those types of numbers on the job mm -hmm. side of things, typically a sign that the economy um, is weakening and is not quite as strong as what we would want to expect. Uh, so, John, when you look at the tea leaves of all the moving pieces here and some of the news coming out, um, there's some good things and there's some maybe not so good things. How are we supposed to interpret that? You know, I think that if people would go back and look at deep dives over the last three months, uh, one of the things that is an underlying theme has been to watch employment numbers. And at the end of the day, employment is the driver of the economy. And um, we know consumer spending is really the gasoline, it's the catalyst. However, if we do not have a growing employment and then a growing wage of employees, then we're not going to see the economy move forward. And so we did see unemployment tick up here in the last couple of months. On top of that, um, we had a downward revision of new jobs created in the past 12 months of 818,000. So there was, it means that there were 818,000 fewer jobs created in the economy than what was first reported. And then on top of it, Drew, as you had mentioned, the vast majority of those new jobs that were created were either federal, state, or municipal employees, or they were um, in the healthcare industry, um, or um, they were tied as far as to um, as far as to just governmental work as far as an education. And so when you look at all those, those are very valuable needed jobs as far as in some of those roles in healthcare and education. However, they do not bring a lot of additional economic benefit to the overall economy in our society. And so because of that, we have to say the jobs that were created are not going to be ones that drive the economy. And so that has led then to saying the soft landing the Federal Reserve has been shooting for, it actually might be a little bit harder than what they anticipated. And so there were two financial levers that were being pulled, one of which was interest rates. And so whenever they want to stimulate growth in the economy, 
then the Federal Reserve does increase interest rates. And that's a headline announcement. Uh, it's what everyone looks at. But if they want to actually you know, stimulate growth, they decrease interest rates. So to slow down, we increase rates, make it more expensive to borrow money by corporations and businesses. But then also they want to increase the economy, they lower interest rates. And so make it cheaper to borrow money. The second lever that's pulled, though, and is actually the one that is much more impactful, is money supply. In other words, the number of dollars that are in the system. So we use the phrase, hear the phrase printing money. The government's printing money. At the end of the day, how many dollars are in the U.S. economy? And there's four different measurements. The one that we find most useful is what's called M2, the money supply number two. And that is the measurement of the total money supply in the United States. And I'm reading the definition here on my other screen. It includes all cash in people's possession as well as money in checking, savings, and short-term savings, such as CDs, and also money in money market accounts. So over the last two and a half years, the Federal Reserve has been pulling out up to $20 billion a month out of the economy. And the thing that's interesting is that doesn't mean they're just burning those dollars. They're actually sitting on the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. And so they created the money, and they put it into the economy, with all the dollars in the economy, people had more money, so they spent those dollars on a limited supply of goods. And when you do that, limited supply, we have high demand, people have more money, that pushed inflation higher. And so the big number drew coming up is the Federal Reserve lowering interest rates by 25 to 50 basis points, but that's not the whole story, is it? It's not at all. It's not at all. And so, John, you know, I think a lot of people, whenever they hear interest rates are decreasing, there's cause for concern, or, you know, there's money being sucked out of the economy. Uh, how does timing play a role? Because um, I think a lot of us we live in such an instant society today with the advent of technology. We think that as soon as that lever is pulled, there's going to be an immediate impact. But it takes time for those different fiscal policy changes to actually trickle down into the economy. So when we back up and look at portfolios and retirement income plans, how are we supposed to balance maybe some concerns about the economy with making personal financial decisions in the here and now? That's a phenomenal question. And quite honestly, it's one that really deals with the psychology of the investor. Um, and so at the end of the day, we see a lot of people are very reactionary. And so they hear news, they react to those news. And oftentimes that immediate reaction is the wrong reaction. And so you want to be taking a bigger picture view to say, what is the intermediate term and long-term health of the overall economy? And even though the economy itself, let's say the economy is not, not as strong as what we think it should be. So they're lowering interest rates and they're going to slow down the amount of dollars they're pulling out of the economy for M2 supply. So they're doing those two things. They're, they're making it more, um, more loose as far as being for the economy to have a little, more fr a little bit less friction, a little bit more fluid as far as in growth. And so we're saying, boy, that means the economy is in trouble. But that doesn't mean every sector or every area of the economy is in trouble. So number one, take a step back and say, what are your goal objectives? What is it you're wanting to do within the next 12 months, five years, 10 years, and then 20 years? Based upon your answer on that, then you look to say, where is the economy at right now? And if you have a larger expense item in the next 12 months, in a period of time, we know the economy is going to be slowing down or lowering interest rates to be able to adjust and make up for that. Well, then you'd want to say, let's take less risk and let's go into an instrument which we have no stock market volatility because volatility will amp up in those seasons. But if you're looking at 20 years down the line until you're going to need your retirement dollars, or maybe in some of your retirement dollars, well, then you might say, hey, the retirement dollars I need in the next 12 to 24 months, we're going to take a little bit less risk on that. That's the bucket strategy we communicate all the time. But for the dollars you're going to touch 10 years, 20 years down the line, you may only make modest adjustments. Or you may be saying, let's go into a different sector that performs better in those environments. And right now, we are seeing certain defensive sectors outperforming. Uh, one area is right now utilities, electric utilities as a sector, have outperformed over the last six to eight weeks. And we look for that trend to continue on. Certain money center banks do better whenever interest rates end up going down. And so you want to look for certain sectors that are performing better, even though the economy may be slowing down. And so, Drew, it's not a matter of saying all out, all in. It's a matter of saying, what are your objectives? Make sure you align your portfolios with the objectives moving forward. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and guys, just a real brief update. I know you talked with your advisors about how we're managing money inside of client portfolios. Um, but to John's point, what we've done is we've actually been overweighting uh, to the Dow Jones and dividend payers, which are comprised largely of those utility companies with some financial institutions in there as well. And the reason we're overweighting there um, is because we enjoyed a nice run up in the NASDAQ and technology side of the S&P 500. While the Dow Jones and dividend companies lagged here going back to the start of 2023. Uh, but in the last few weeks and months, we've started to see those dividend plays really start to be the leaders in the market. And so we want to be overweighted to those right now. Uh, but also, we've been taking some gains out of our high growth positions to just be in a safety position to see how all these things shake out. Um, and John, one of the hardest things to do in investing is to be patient, right? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. you just want to chase the market. Uh, but right now, what we're seeing is even though the market's maybe edging up a little bit, momentum is falling. And why is it important, John, to identify that divergence between price and momentum and then ensure that you're patient whenever you see that trend emerge? Yeah, you have to be patient. Oftentimes, you see people they have this fear of missing out whenever things are, are, are trickling higher. And so then they go all in and they take off at a sprint whenever the momentum is slowing down. So we want to look at what we call price action. You want to say, where? what are we seeing with the momentum in the market? And right now, we're seeing fewer names that are hitting highs. We're seeing fewer advancers. We're seeing more decliners. Across the board, we're not seeing the strength in the big names that we saw before. So even though we are seeing price move a little higher over the last 8 to 10 days, we were actually seeing underlying momentum and strength slowing down. So that's something called divergence. And so whenever we see divergence, that's generally a sign that we're about ready to see price start to pull off to the downside. Now, that being said, any trigger can trigger it one way or the other. And so momentum could all of a sudden pick up if we see some positive numbers come out of an economic set. But right now, it's showing that momentum is slowing down, so you want to be extra cautious. Our mindset right now is the surest way to make money is not to lose it. And so we want to say, let's be protected a little bit. Let's be wise. And that's also why you our fixed income. We started increasing maturity length because if interest rates started to go down, which they have on the bond market by over 50 to 75 basis points in the last three weeks, um, that means that by us increasing maturities, our fixed income investors are also doing better. So look at momentum, look at price action, make small tweaks and adjustments along the way. Absolutely. And John, to your point, um, on the fixed income side of things, our fixed income models up just over 8% over the last 12 months, which, John, that, that's a stock-like return that we're receiving from bonds. And the biggest reason for that is we had the worst drawdown in history for U.S. bonds going all the way back to the start of 2020. Um, and so there's some great opportunity in that longer-term bond market. Um, and right now, John, we would say it's probably not the time uh, to be fully allocating 100% of new dollars directly into the stock market. Parking it in that fixed income model is a great way to have strong return potential with much lower risk as we wait to see how things shake out here on the economy yeah. and market. And Drew, so, I would even take it. Drew, I would take it a step further than that. Um, I would say, folks, if you have cash that's sitting in the bank right now, interest rates are starting to go down. Um, I would look at reallocating those dollars as a holding tank into our fixed income sleeve. Um, because we'll be able to lock in some better rates. And if interest rates do move down, you have a little bit of yield on that as we're waiting for a pullback in the equity market, which you can reallocate. So I would even look at dollars that you're sitting, keeping your powder dry as far as in uh, money market accounts, looking at having some of that reallocated over toward a bond fund. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. And John, you know, on that note, we'll go ahead and end things here. Mm -hmm. What is one thought that you just want people to take into uh, the month of September here and the week ahead? You know, since it's in September and October are two of the, the historically hardest months as far as stock market return. We have a lot of headwinds right now, uh, quite honestly, coming into play. Um, and so uh, one of the things I always want to make sure everybody looks at is this. Always invest with long-term objectives. And so you don't want to be reactionary. You want to say, hey, let's plan accordingly. Let's prepare for the worst. Let's expect the best. Let's guys, let's have our plan in place. Let's make wise, smart decisions based on whatever momentum is telling us. And by doing that, you're going to get money ahead and you're going to accomplish those goals whenever you want to be there. Awesome. Awesome. Totally agree on that, friend. So, guys, thank you for the time. I hope we've, uh, we hope you found this interesting and helpful to kind of 
break down a little bit of some of the news you're probably seeing in your day-to-day -day life. If you have any questions about your investment portfolio or your broader retirement income plan, we would encourage you to reach out to your advisor. Our team is fully briefed on all, everything that we just walked through here, and they can help you take a look at your own personal situation and goals and make sure that you are fully squared away on that front. So thanks for the time, guys. We look forward to seeing you all soon, and we'll talk to you as well. Have a good one.